All right, hi everybody. Uh, it's Scott Harrison. I'm here at Charity Water. Uh, we're trying this new, uh, pretty cool thing. I think. Yes, uh, sir. With live signing. Yes, sir. I'm here with uh, my buddy Jordan, uh, who is going to be hosting this session. We're so glad you joined us. Uh, we're going to be spending the next 45 minutes talking about the book, talking about Charity Water. Yep. I think you've got some questions from uh, from people that were submitted. Yeah. Uh, T tell me more. Yes, it's great to be here. Hey, we're excited uh, for all of you who have joined so far. Let me just run through quickly how this is going to work. This is a time for you to get to know Scott, um, get to know a little bit more about his book. He's going to be signing books the entire time. So these okay. are books you can purchase signed books and uh, he'll be signing them here and they will be shipped to you uh, after the event. So uh, if you're watching on Facebook Live uh, to buy a book, Go to premiercollectibles.com slash thirst. That's the title of the book. You'll be able to purchase a signed copy. And if you do so, you can then submit questions for us to answer. In that, in that flow? In that flow, right. Awesome. And we will also be uh, watching Facebook Live uh, and the other platforms here for, uh, for does engagement. It, so. Does it matter that my signature is not very neat? It does not matter. You can sign whatever you'd I've like. I've never liked my signature. Well, you know what? You can, you can sign. It's your book. You can sign whatever you want. So let's dive right in. Scott, I want to know what it was like to write a book. Did you enjoy this process? Did you hate it? Did, what was it like? What, tell me more. Oh, there were, that's a loaded question. I know. It, there were moments where it was great. There were moments where it was terrible. It was a two year process. Uh, I got to work with an amazing woman uh, named Lisa out in, uh, in California, uh, in, in Los Angeles area, uh, who wound up uh, plumbing the depths of my soul. Uh, I'm not naturally very introspective. Uh, normally thinking about the future, interested in the facts. Yeah. And she would say, well, how, how did you feel at that moment? Like, I don't know how I felt. So it was, it was great having a partner uh, really encourage, you know, a deeper vulnerability, some, <laughs> maybe some more uh, introspection that would come naturally for me. Uh, Lisa came to Africa with me and really became a member of the family. Uh, well loved and adored by my wife, which was, which was very important. Yeah. I mean, she, she kind of became an adopted man, member of the family. Um, and it was, it was just a, a really cool process. You know, in, uh, a lot of the childhood stuff was easy because my mom was a journalist and had documented so much of living with this debilitating disease, the carbon monoxide gas leak, so much of that family trauma. And I was able to go and read uh, much of the things that she'd written and then that would stir up memories where I remembered how I felt about that as a six-year-old kid or a right. 10-year-old. So that, that part was, um, was easier. I would say the hardest part was the 10 years when I was partying and um, <laughs> drugging in New York City, if I'm going to be honest, working at the 40 clubs. That, we spent a lot of time interviewing club owners, people that I worked with. That was probably the hardest part of the yeah. process because yep. I screwed a bunch of people over. I mean, I was a, I was a real degenerate and, and hearing the reflections of, of how I had uh, how I hurt some people, you know, during that time was really, really tough to, to face. So that was probably the hardest part, both just remembering because mm -hmm. so much of it was fueled by, uh, you know, l let's say not, not necessarily 10 sober years. Right. And then uh, it got, it felt like it got really easy again when I went to Liberia as a photojournalist on the Mercy ship because I was writing almost every day. Uh, so I would look at photos. I mean, I would I would read the the blogs and the the diary effectively that I kept. So that was that was easy. And then on to Charity Water in a world of email. I'm one of those guys that saves all email. So there was there's a character in the book called Ross who was one of my mentors, and uh, was looking just in my Gmail archive. I think I I think it was thirty thousand oh emails exchanged back and forth just with between him over a five year period. So, you know, we had these, these moments of, you know, there were significant gifts. I could go and find the email that triggered that, that story. Yep. Uh, so it was, it was a, it's amazing. The hardest thing was probably being away from the kids a lot because I would, I would have to go away to just get away from the hecticness, hectic, uh, life of a one year old and a three year old yep. who wanted every minute to be climbing on me or, you know, pulling at me or, um, spilling something on me. So that was, my, my wife was very patient allowing me to go to, you know, a cabin here. I actually finished the book in a donated room at the Greenwich Hotel. Oh wow. A few blocks from my house. Okay. So I was going and writing at night, sleeping in the hotel, 
working in the morning and then I'd kind of see my kids, yep. you know, go give them a bath, but then go back to the hotel. So they were kind enough for the home stretch. So I had all these different places around the world that I was yep. able to get three days, five days here. Very cool. That's awesome. So you, overall, this was a, a positive experience and uh, Yeah, and then really you don't know if anybody's going to like it. Right? And then so yeah, you kind of put it out there. there and, yeah, exactly. So you, uh, the, the book, by the way, an amazing book. I have read the book. I have a signed copy myself. I did not get it at premiercollectibles.com, but I would have. Again, premiercollectibles.com slash thirst is where you can buy signed copies. Scott is gonna be, be signing, signing some books today. And, uh, and you can order a copy. You will be able to submit questions um, once you do that. And- uh, Need a better Sharpie. Uh-oh, <laughs> we, need, we need more, uh, another Sharpie. So stress. Scott, while well, you're signing books, yep. um, you know this book is very much about Charity Water, but it's also about your story. And uh, like you said, you, you went back and you really did a deep dive into your time in New York and your time abroad. Uh, this is another loaded question. Give us kind of just a, a, a bit of an overview of your time in New York and then how that, you know, what, what really inspired you to come back and start Charity Water. Yeah. Well, I'd, I'd spent 10 years, so from 18 to 28, here in New York City, um, uh, working at 40 different nightclubs. So, living what I thought was my version of the dream and, and effectively drinking for a living, uh, hosting these crazy parties where a thousand people would turn up and spend insane amounts of money inside these, these clubs. Uh, and then the turning point really came at 28 when I realized I'd become the worst person I knew. I was, I was just a, a degenerate. And I'd come so far from the moral and the spiritual heritage that my parents had, had brought me up under. And, you know, write about this kind of in much more detail in the book. But I found an opportunity to just change my life and effectively start over at 28. Sold everything I owned, joined a humanitarian mission for one year. Okay. And that was the idea to see where one year might take me yep. on a new path. And that landed me in uh, one of the craziest countries in the world, post-war Liberia, right after a 14-year civil war had ended. And I was going in with a group of humanitarian doctors and surgeons who were there to pick up the pieces. Uh, it was a country with no electricity, with no running water, with no sewage system. You couldn't send a letter to anyone in the country. There was one doctor for every 50,000 people. So I think we have a doctor for every 200 and so yep. you know, wow. us here in America. So when you got sick in this country, you were just out of luck. So we brought in a huge 522 foot hospital ship uh, equipped with 42 beds, state of the art emergency rooms, MRIs, CT scans. I remember when we were in Liberia, we had the only CT scan in three neighboring countries. It's amazing. So patients would come from Guinea, from Benin, from Togo, from the Ivory Coast. They would flock from these neighboring countries to see our doctors. And we were able to help thousands and thousands of people uh, on this hospital ship. So it was an extraordinary experience. People would walk up the ship blind. Uh, and then thanks to a 20 minute cataract surgery that cost a few hundred dollars, they would walk off the ship the next day being able to see. Yep. So and your role there was, okay, you were documented, exactly. I was documented. So I was the, the volunteer photojournalist. I was taking the pictures. I was writing the stories in the hope that the organization would use these pictures and stories to raise awareness and yep. raise more money. Yep. So the cool thing is that I had a built-in guest list. So I had 15,000 people on my club list that I just began telling a very different story. So yep. instead of come to the Gucci party or whatever the hot club of the, the moment was, uh, learn about these doctors meeting these needs. Yep. Uh, learn about a little boy uh, who had a tumor removed or a woman uh, in her 60s who had a cleft lip her entire life and had food and water spilling out of her mouth for 60 some years and then was fixed in a 30 minute surgery and looked beautiful yep. you know, and, and, and uh, was able to go back into her village like a, like a new woman. So I was telling all these stories and you know, of course a few people unsubscribed uh, they weren't used to getting that kind of content, but so many others began to send money into Mercy Ships, began to contribute, uh, and even began to volunteer. So that was really how I learned that maybe the same uh, skill of promoting could just be used in a, in a very different way. Yep. And so then, okay, so then you, you were there, and that's, what, what inspired you then to jump in and start Charity Water itself? So what was it about the mission 
yeah, that well, brought you? I, so the first year was really all about medicine for me and, and spending time with the doctors. The second year, uh, I got off the ship more. I got uh, I spent more time in the rural areas, and I just saw the dirty water that people were drinking, and I couldn't believe that half of the country was drinking from disgusting swamps and ponds and rivers. And I started learning about all the diseases associated with bad water mm -hmm. and how that was impacting the health of the country. Uh, at the time, the, the statistic was half of the world's hospital beds are occupied by people suffering waterborne disease. Wow. So one of the chief medical officers effectively said to me, hey, this is great, we're doing all these expensive surgeries, but if you really care about health, go and attack the root cause of so much of this global sickness. Go work on water. At the time, there were a billion people living in the world that didn't have clean water to drink. So I really discovered it on that second tour as it was related to some of the diseases and the symptoms we were seeing. Got Trachoma it. is a waterborne disease. Um, schistosomiasis, uh, some of the um, cancrum oris or noma or the fleshing diseases we were seeing, uh, the doctors would link back to unsafe water. So uh, it was really in an interest of making a wider impact on health than maybe these very few expensive surgeries. A couple thousand surgeries, but mm -hmm. could we impact millions of people yep. by getting them clean water? It's amazing. So again, if you'd like to buy, we're, uh, Scott is signing books. Uh, if you'd like to buy a copy of his signed book, you can go to Premier Collectibles slash Thirst. That's the title of the book. You can purchase a copy of the book signed. You'll be able to then submit questions. And we're gonna go ahead and take a question uh, from the audience now. Um, Sean in Van, Texas. All right, Sean. Van, Texas. Hey, Sean. So Sean says, I'm currently a photographer for Mercy Ships. No way. How cool is that? Uh, and can relate to that part of your story very well, obviously. And I was wondering if you've seen any direct or measurable impact that you've had on other charities and or evidence of changing the face of charity as a whole. Uh, that's a great question. Thanks for the question. Um, we know now, you know, being at this for 12 years that, gosh, if I had to guess, 30 or 40 other charities have said that they started because they were inspired wow. by Charity Water. Okay. Um, and that might be... A, I remember speaking in high schools and colleges and grad schools where somebody might say, oh, I saw that talk and I focus on a different issue. So we've, we've both heard that water charities have been started with Charity Water as an inspiration and also uh, other organizations sometimes using our 100% model, sometimes just using some of the practices of innovation or design or branding or storytelling and adopting that to focus on the cause that that social entrepreneur might be mm -hmm. passionate about. Um, there's there's uh, one uh, friend I have that uh, we, we almost hired him here. We made a mistake not to, and he went out and started an organization that's raised you know over ten million dollars. Oh, wow. That's doing shelter, and they're helping uh, people with homes. You know, so another basic need using the hundred percent model. Uh, great group called New Story uh, that people can check out. So. Yeah, it's, 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 it's fun to be able to just share some of the knowledge, some of the things that have worked for us in the hope that it could be useful to others and hopefully other people won't make some of the mistake, same mistakes yep. that I write about in the book as well. And, um, and I feel like, I, if I remember correctly, you mentioned in the book that at the time, was it 40% of America? There was a study done, 40% of America? Yeah, 42%. Yeah. Okay. Uh, so that's you know the, the, the model. So the mission was to provide clean and safe drinking water to everybody on the world. So we have achieved our mission when no one drinks dirty water. 663 million people that's now long. away from that mission. So now it's about a tenth of the world that's drinking bad water today as, as we record this and as people are watching. Um, so we want that number to be zero. The vision is actually to reimagine or reinvent charity, to bring some of these cynical or skeptical people who are distrustful mm -hmm. of charities and, and they have a, a, a myriad reasons why they might not be giving. Some of them don't trust how much of their money will actually reach people in need. Others believe the charities are bloated or bureaucratic or inefficient. You know, others believe that charity CEOs are making Two, three million dollars a year, and the money's not getting you know to the poor. So uh, really, we, we try to solve that with uh, our 100% model. So for 12 years, 100% of all public donations have gone directly to fund water projects that help people get clean water. And then in another bank account, a separately audited bank account, 
we have a very small group of families, about 130 families that pay for all the overhead. Okay. So you're here in our headquarters, there are over 80 full-time employees here, um, about 25,000, 27,000 square feet here in New York City. All of this, from my salary to the phone bill, to the insurance, to the toner for the copy machine, is paid for by 130 donors. Over a million donors have been able to contribute okay. to Charity Water, whether they uh, where their child sends in a dollar, which mm -hmm. happens all the time, or someone writes a million dollar check, knowing all that money can go directly to clean water. It's amazing. So that was kind of um, one of the things that just worked well for us. Incredibly hard as well. I write about all the challenges mm -hmm. and, and kind of the warnings yeah. for other people uh, that might think that looks easy or might want to adopt that model. Um, you know, there's a lot of beware. Yep. It's, it's incredibly challenging. You've got to do two things at the same time, and then you have to run effectively these two bank accounts in perfect balance. Yep. And you didn't know this was going to that idea was going to work. When you started not. this, right? Absolutely. I mean, this it was your vision. Work. It almost didn't work. Yeah. Um, there were a couple of moments, you know, in, in where, it, where it looked like it was not going to work. Yep. Um, okay, so we are signing books. I am not signing books. Scott signing books, and. Um, you can buy a copy of the signed book at premiercollectibles.com slash thirst. That's we should say all the money book. goes to the organization. Yes, so uh, the, that's right. So the net proceeds from the book yep. go. The advance, all that goes straight yep. to the back to cool. um, You can submit questions uh, if you purchase a book. So please send in your questions and uh, we will answer them here. You have. You can look at the back of the book and see some pretty cool endorsements. You've obviously had, um, I won't say shout outs, they are, pretty incredible uh, people come behind this mission and come behind this book in particular. Talk a little bit about some of your favorite uh, endorsements and the people who have come out to support. Yeah, well it was, uh, the book came out uh, in October, so it was a pretty competitive time. It was in the midst of all of the, the midterm elections yep. and all of the Trump books, it felt like we're getting dropped, <laughs> you know, the same week. Fear in the White House and Stormy Daniels and uh, and it was it was pretty amazing to, uh, to wake up on launch day, you know, I remember turning on my computer and Bill Gates was telling over 40 million people um, to go and, and buy the book and to learn about this story in Charity Water and Michael Bloomberg, our former mayor here uh, in New York, Richard Branson, Ariana Huffington, just some people and entrepreneurs I really respect. That's amazing. Um, we're, we're effectively getting behind the project, which was, which was really cool and it did wind up debuting on the New York Times bestseller list and that was a cool experience. Yep. I remember being in an airport on the book tour uh, in a little restaurant and getting the call from Penguin Random House saying, you guys did it, like New York Times So that was fun. That's awesome. Um, that was really cool. Uh, talk to me about the article that came out this weekend. So this is pretty exciting. Uh, New York Times ran an article um, about a new model you have. Again, something new that you're introducing or, or bringing to the market here. Tell us a little bit about what that what that was about. And sure. So we're trying to uh, scale the organization. So at the moment, so we've helped about 10 million people get clean water uh, in the last. It's taken 12 years to do that. And 12 years and 10 million. 12 years okay. and 10 million people. Um, we now, by 2025, want to get another 25 million people clean water. Uh, we're going to need to raise a billion dollars to do that. Okay. So it's about $40 all in um, to get one person access to clean water. So one of the biggest challenges we think about raising a billion dollars and scaling the organization, um, and again, powered by small donations. The beauty of Charity Water is that when we talk about raising a billion dollars, it's $10 at a time. It's eight dollars and fifteen cents that a six-year-old sends in an envelope. Mm -hmm. So it's really this movement of now, you know, well over a million donors from 110 plus countries that are coming together with these little small donations that are adding up to this huge, huge type total. So one of the the challenges for us as we grow our staff is we uh, both deploy that money, you know, work in 20 plus countries around the world. Uh, is, is keeping the 100% model intact. So the story in the New York Times is about a new program that we're calling The Pool. So we have The Spring, which is our monthly giving yep. program. We have The Well, which are those 130 families that pay for the overhead. Now we have The Pool, okay. which is, is really just a way for uh, entrepreneurs who are starting businesses, big businesses, small businesses, to donate a portion of their equity to help us keep the 100% model intact, but also uh, start a small bonus pool for the employees. Okay. So we have an amazing team here 
you know, many of the people that are working at Charity Water could be working at Google or Facebook or, or WeWork, and many of them have made financial sacrifices to work in the nonprofit sector. So we wanted to create uh, a bonus pool for our employees based on the organization's performance, so not based on the performance of any of the stocks that we would get, but also a way for other entrepreneurs and founders to be able to contribute, not only to keep the 100% model going, mm -hmm. but also be able to reward our employees based on the impact and the performance of the organization. And you're the only so, one, you guys are the yeah, only one who are doing this right now? I mean, this uh, is... You know, know, I mean, we, 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 we don't know of others doing it. You know, people have taken their liquid assets for a right. while. I think the yeah. structure of our employee pool is is, um, is pretty unique, and um, there are many levels and many controls, and you know, there's a huge amount of complexity in that. We've worked with very smart people for over a year yep. structuring it, um, from tax attorneys to uh, inside counsel and external counsel. Um, but we think it's we think it's a, a pretty innovative uh, cool. approach to scaling our 100% model and also recruiting and retaining the, the best talent yep. to execute against these uh, unbelievably challenging goals. Let's take another question from the audience. Uh, again, as a reminder, you can go to premiercollectibles.com slash thirst uh, to purchase an autographed copy of the book. Scott is signing books right now. Uh, and, and then you'll be able to, to submit questions. So send in a question uh, and we'll try to get to it today. So Emily in Pennsylvania, and you, you've, you've talked about this briefly, uh, but maybe for those who are just joining us, um, Emily asks, from Pennsylvania, how do you implement the 100% model while still having a sustainable back office? So we just talked about yeah. this, but maybe maybe go into um, talking about the well a little bit more in depth and, and how you created that community, because really that's a, a, a pretty strong, tight-knit community. Yeah, so, you know, in a sense, what people that, that are proponents of Charity Water or our model like about this is just the um, the radical clarity. There are actually two bank accounts. Mm -hmm. There is a water bank account where over a million gifts have gone and 100% of that money goes straight to the field. We even pay back the credit card fees that come into that account. So if someone were to go online at Charity Water right now, donate $100. Uh, if you use your Amex, we get $97. Uh, I wish that Amex and MasterCard and Visa took no fees, but they do. We take that $97 we reach into our other bank account, we pull back that 3%, we add it to your 97, and then we send the $100 to the field. And then we track that and prove that $100. So I think people like the clarity. Now, mm -hmm. people are open to a lot of value propositions. We have donors that ask us specifically to pay for the overhead. They believe in us, they trust the organization, they've looked at the numbers and the efficiency and the We've gotten the top ratings from every single watchdog group that has analyzed Charity Water for 10 years, um, of which there are eight, I think. And they say, great, great we actually want to pay for the office rent. We want to pay for the toner. We want So those 135 families, uh, in some ways, there are backers, there are investors. They know that they are making it possible for kids to go out there and mm -hmm. do lemonade stands and provide a, a greater significance to $9 of lemonade sales, when all $9 goes to help people get clean water and, and can be tracked. So that's how we've done it. We've just told that story. We need, we have, we have 85 people here. Mm -hmm. They show up every single day. They work full time at Charity Water. We're hiring 20 people at the moment. Wow. So we'll be just over 100 uh, you know, in, in six months from now. And those people are needed to both raise the money and then implement the projects in a high quality, sustainable way. Amazing. So I think it's just there are different value propositions. What people like is just knowing what they're buying. Yep. What their money is going to do. You know, and if I told people that are watching right now that our biggest need was that our copy machine broke, and we really need this copy machine for whatever reasons, because I don't know, we have to print a lot of cards yeah. or something. Yeah, right. But we need $450 to fix our copy machine. People right now would give $450 to meet that need. You ever want to meet needs? And you would know your money is going to fix a broken copy machine. What, uh, what we resist or what we, we think um, we're trying to solve for is just the opacity. Is that my money goes into some giant general pot. I have no idea where it goes. Does it go into an endowment? Does it go to programs? It's just that kind of, that overall yep. fungibility that what we've heard from people is that they don't like that. They wanna know what we're doing with their money and what impact it will have. Happy for that. 
to pay for a staff member, maybe happy for it to fix a broken copier. Mm -hmm. um, a million people have been very happy for it to go straight to the field and help people get clean water. But just the clarity is what we really believe in. It's amazing. You, one thing, and, and I'll do a quick reminder, premiercollectibles.com slash thirst, that's where you buy signed copies of uh, the book here, New York Times bestselling book, Thirst. Um, talk to me, in the book you tell a story, you guys have done some really cool campaigns, and one of them was the, the birthday party mm -hmm. uh, model, and there's an amazing story in your book, and, and I think uh, I'd love for you to tell it about the girl who raised, uh, you know, who donated her birthday, and then yeah, yeah. So I was uh, speaking in Seattle to uh, to a group, and uh, there was uh, a little girl in the audience, um, and I was talking about this idea of donating birthdays. So we basically said, look, we have birthday. Everybody has a birthday every year. They're typically celebrations of ourselves. We get gifts. Sometimes we throw ourselves parties. Uh, we are celebrated by our friends and loves, loved ones. And we wondered what if we could turn the birthday into a moment that really wasn't about ours, but a moment that was about others. What if we could turn them into generous moments? So about 12 years ago, we stumbled onto this idea of asking people to donate their birthdays to Charity Water, skip the gifts, mm -hmm. skip the birthday party. Yep. And then the, the hook was that you would ask for your age in dollars. So you're turning 17, okay. hey, can I have $17 for Got my 17th birthday? If you're turning 84, can I have $84 for your 84th? If you're turning six, $6. So there was a seven-year-old uh, in Austin, Texas, uh, Max Schmidhauser, that was one of the first to just blow this out of the water. And he started knocking on doors asking for $7 and wound up raising over $20,000. Um, With $7 and, donations. Uh, there were some, okay, were some yeah. He lived in a nice neighborhood. Yeah, right, okay. Uh, so <laughs> there were definitely some, some, some donations that were a little more. But yeah, a lot of sevens. Okay. Um, some 77s, a couple 777s. So uh, Rachel Beckwith in, in Seattle, uh, was eight, turning nine, sets a goal of raising $300, does raise some money, raises $220, but she is bummed. She, Fall, fall short by eighty dollars, and uh, she tells her mom that she's going to try harder the next year. You know, she she feels like she's let people down mm -hmm. because she didn't reach her goal perfectly. And uh, tragically, right after her birthday, there was a there was a terrible car crash, and she was killed. Her her mom was driving, uh, and her sister was in the front. She was in the back, and a tractor trailer derailed, and uh, and and took her life. And the, the church that she went to, um, one of the pastors kind of rallied around this campaign. Um, the family wound up reopening her $220 campaign because her, effectively her last wish was for kids she never met uh, across the world to get clean water uh, instead of gifts, instead of celebrating herself with a birthday party like I'm sure all her mm -hmm. friends. I mean, anybody that has a nine-year-old knows this is the common thing to do. Uh, and, and, you know, very quickly people in this church start giving $9, $9, $9, $9, and the story spreads, and it spreads through the Seattle community, it starts spreading through the country, it spreads into Europe, it spreads down into Africa, and people in Africa start donating $9 in honor of this uh, Seattle girl who wanted to help people around the world get clean water. Uh, she goes from raising $220 that she saw when she was mm -hmm. alive to raising over $1.3 million. Oh my gosh. And what was so beautiful, her depth of compassion, her story uh, catalyzed over 37,000 strangers to give. It's amazing. You know, they think there was just something so disruptive about the, the, the well of compassion, you know, within this girl that, that cared so much about people she'd never met. Um, what was even so we write about that and, and we got to take her family on the one year anniversary of her death So exactly 365 days later to Ethiopia to go village to village to village to meet the thousands of children that had clean water because of Rachel and it was a, a really moving and profound experience um, even cooler now that some more time has gone by we went and we looked at what those 37,000 people did afterwards and so many of them were inspired by Rachel giving mm -hmm. up her birthday, they gave up their birthday, they raised another $2 million. It's amazing. So this little girl had a vision of raising $300, has now raised over $3 million 
impacted over a hundred thousand people's lives with clean water. Amazing. And I think it just shows you know, the power of, of a single person, uh, the purity of vision, how, uh, how a single story can, can be amplified, can inspire people, can disrupt them, yep. uh, can move them into action, can uh, cause them to reject the apathy that might be so easy to embrace with a paralyzing global issue, right? Yeah. And there's probably people watching, what could I ever do about the global water crisis? I mean, 663 million people, but a little nine-year-old girl said, it's I amazing. can help a couple people. It's amazing. And instead of helping 10 people, she helped 100,000 and counting. It's amazing. Let's take one more question from the audience here, and, and uh, uh, we're, we're starting to come to the end of this. This has been a lot of fun. Scott signing books. You can still buy signed copies, and you can continue to buy copies after uh, after this signing at premiercollectibles.com slash thirst. Uh, Gary in San Jose, California asks, what's your plan, your vision for the next five to 10 years internationally and perhaps locally, for example, Flint? Yep. Um, so we're really focused on the rural access to port. You know, we, we took a look at Flint, so just, uh, just to mention that when it happened. Um, we just, we don't offer anything there. You know, mm -hmm. over a billion dollars of infrastructure repairs were needed. Uh, money was coming from federal, from state. Uh, Flint didn't need any New York City mm -hmm. organization working in Africa to parachute in and try and grab donations. Or, uh, so we, we actually told our supporters to go and support a bunch of local charities that had been working in Flint for many years uh, on that problem. So there's really no plans to, uh, you know, America officially has 100% water coverage. Many of the countries we're working in have 20% water coverage, 40% water coverage. So we're really focused on the rural, uh, those, those living around the world without access to clean water that live in the rural areas. Of the 663 million people, 82% of them are now in these rural farming communities. Okay. Only 18% are living in the cities and the towns. So we're focused on the 82%. Uh, and we're, we're expanding into new countries. We added Madagascar uh, last year. We're adding a couple new countries this year. So we're working now with over 30 partners in over 20 countries. And really the vision is, is to get another 25 million people clean water by 2025. So okay. if we're successful, uh, at the end of 2025, Charity Water has helped 35 million people get clean water um, and we're currently at 10. So it's a, it's, it's quite a, a scale. Quite now. a jump, but yeah. Okay, great. Well, let's do, uh, we're gonna do a quick game and okay. uh, before we wrap up today. So I told you I'm terrible at these I, things. I know, but we'll, we'll get through it quickly. Two minutes, 22 questions. The goal here is for your uh, followers and fans here to get to know you a little bit better. So um, I'm gonna run through these questions and uh, you know, answer the first thing that comes to mind. So, um, who would you like to have dinner with, past or present? Um, I think Albert Schweitzer. You okay. know, one of the one of the great humanitarians, and uh, always been a fan. Which one, Game of Thrones, Game of Thrones, or Stranger Things? Okay, I'm gonna be I'm gonna disappoint people here, but neither. Okay. I don't like nightmares. I just <laughs> I don't like scary things. Not I don't like blood okay. and guts. Not into incest. Just just <laughs> never watched either of them. All right. Uh, what's your favorite breakfast food? Um, I'm an eggs guy. All right. Uh, anyway, what's your favorite genre of music? Uh, these days, I've been listening to tons of classical again, which is just, I think there's something about the hecticness of travel and young kids at home, and it puts my kids to sleep. There you I go. I put on uh, Ravel. I, mean, I don't know if I'm saying that right. R A V E L. But I've got like the songs that the minute I put it on, they're out. They're out. <laughs> So that's just that's working for me. I love it. All right. Just I just run it on repeat. Whatever's working. Yeah. By the second or the third time, it's just they're snoring. I love it. Who was your idol growing up? Oh man. Um, <laughs> I thought Evil Knievel was cool. Um, I thought Mr. T was cool from the A Team. Okay. I used to love that show. This probably dates me. Sledgehammer. You know, it would have been uh, what was that? David Rash was the actor. All I, right. I thought they were the coolest. Mr. T and David Rash. There you go. What is your, and you travel all the time, you guys are, are always going uh, to different countries. What's your favorite international cuisine? Well, I like street meat, as they call it, okay. in, uh, in the Central African Republic. It's some of the best food I've ever had, uh, driving on the streets through the rainforest of the CAR, um, and just whatever the locals street cook. Meat. That okay. was, that's what we fondly call it. I mean, you don't, have, okay. you don't have many okay. options in the, in the CAR, <laughs> but delicious. What's your favorite candy bar? 
Um, I'm enjoy. Do you have a favorite season? Fall, for sure. What is your favorite childhood memory? Going to the zoo with my mom. Uh, did you, let's see, do you have a favorite animal? Uh, pandas. What is your go-to workout? Since you have a lot of time. Just push-ups. Yeah. Push-ups, okay, there you go. Uh, you can tell I do a lot of them. <laughs> Uh, like 170 pounds soaking wet. What do you never leave home without? Um, wireless headphones. What is your favorite time of day? Twilight. Have you ever ridden in a hot air balloon? No, but we talked about this. I hope my wife is not watching and I don't think she is. Uh, the plan is to do that for my son's birthday and take the whole family out okay. in August. So go. I've been scouting locations and I'm really excited. There, okay. It feels like it's time. It's Before time. you even asked this question, we, yep. were, we were, okay, very I've cool. been working on it this week, actually. What's your favorite pizza topping? Uh, pepperoni, that's so boring, right? Did you have a favorite teacher? I did, Mr. Hall. He let me use computers Okay. in the fifth grade. Who is your favorite author? Uh, probably C.S. Lewis. And who has impacted you the most in your life? Uh, it would definitely be my mom and my dad. Uh, I just lost my mom uh, last year, and you know I've had a lot of time reflecting. She was she was sick growing up, but she did her best to instill you know deep values and morality in me. I got lost for a while, but came home, and that's really thanks to to the work that she and she and my dad did. Amazing. Well, we're out of time. This has been a lot of fun, Scott. Thanks, thanks for thanks uh, for, for hosting this. Of course. And uh, you can still purchase signed copies of the book. Scott is signing books here. Uh, PremierCollectibles.com slash thirst. Um, thank you for what you guys do. And uh, this has been very inspiring. Awesome. Thanks for having me. Thanks for tuning in.